What's up, everybody, and welcome back to the Central Virginia Sport Performance Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Jay DeMeo, and I am fired up to welcome back my co-host from the seminars, from the virtual seminars, and to announce the presenters at the Pittsburgh Seminar, South Carolina's Molly Benetti. Molly, thanks for being with us. Jay, it's good to be back with you, my friend. I'm glad we, uh, we're reunited. Yeah, dude, this is going to be awesome. And getting up north, up to Pittsburgh, it's going to be a blast up at Union Fitness, April 29th and 30th. But before we get too far into this, I mean, I think one thing that'll be kind of fun to, to talk about here, and we were talking a little bit about this before, and I think that this is something that a lot of us that get the privilege of working in college basketball are experiencing right now. Let's talk about what this preseason has been like and this buildup, because it's literally been a lot, like a lot of people, let's say that. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. I mean, I mean, you know, I feel like our, our, the year just is, is all a little bit of a blur uh, because we go, we go all year round. And so like this blending right now, this changing of seasons uh, into official practice, um, you know, everything, everything starts to heighten a little bit, but this past what, eight weeks or so since school started. Um, you know, I've noticed such a shift for us personally, just in the jump of, we went from 11 players last year to 16 players this year. And I mean, that's a lot of players and you've got, I mean, you've got a, a freaking football squad, you've got 20 plus, but six, I mean, just the amount of time and energy, you know, that we pour into these players that, you know, in the basketball setting too, in such a, on such an individual level, you know, it takes, Lot more and and that's the fun part of it I love it but you also I'm also feeling the repercussions of that right now just in terms of my overall uh fatigue and um you know how much I feel like I'm I'm pouring into others on on a daily basis which is even you know making it more important for myself to to make sure that I'm recharging my own batteries but yeah it's been a lot it's been a lot of fun but it's also a lot of chaos and a lot of uh, different things going on and just trying to prepare these guys for season. And we are, I mean, we're in the thick of it now. So we're less than five weeks away from our first game. And I mean, from now until April, you know, you know, the drill it's, it's go time. And, um, but it's, you know, I think coming off of such a, a hectic year last year, and now we're, you know, still dealing with so many different, um, you know, rules and restrictions and we're navigating this, this whole new thing, you know, we never uh, really got a chance to to catch our breaths, and now we're dealing with you know a whole new set of challenges and a whole new you know set of things that we're trying to accomplish. And it's just you know navigating that every day is is a lot, but it's in a, it's in a good way. Uh, you know, I don't I don't mean to say that in a negative connotation at all. It's been it's been good, but it's it takes a lot out of you. No doubt. And we were talking before about how there's definitely way worse situations to have than to have if we may too many you know yeah. players to work with but I think that one thing too that's pretty neat you know with us having the sixth and the fifth year guys and you going through your, your fourth season now with the women down there I think is that 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 evolution and understanding with the the student athlete and their growth and development and understanding and being able to have a larger group with you know, with us, the, the four or five guys that are, I mean, they're literally 24 years old who have been through it all and understand it all. And the, the younger kids to be able to see where like these progressions can go and where these relationships can go and, and what's important and how that they need to not just act because that's just kind of a little too cliche, but more how they need to like take things in to understand, well, why, why am I here at 18, 19 versus why, you know, like for us, like Grant or Nathan or Jacob or Nick are there at 23, 24. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I've been thinking about that a lot too and how cool, you know, being in my fourth year, this is my first senior class that I've, kind of seen through that development process. And, you know, last year on a team of 11, we had one senior. And then this year we have five seniors and five juniors. 
uh, along with, you know, four freshmen and two sophomores. And so to see that development and evolution of, you know, especially for me when I'm starting out and we're establishing, you know, the way that, you know, I obviously came into a really successful culture. And so it was for me, uh, how do I continue that as well as how do I continue to to mold and develop them in, in my own way and to see the growth and maturation and development and leadership um, from those players. And, and it's like a well-oiled machine now where it makes my job really easy because we've got players regulating themselves and each other and they know what the expectations are. They know uh, the standards, they know, they know, they know how to, you know, from our standpoint, they know how to train, they know our process and they run a lot of things themselves. And so it gives me the freedom uh, to coach at a higher level. Obviously the, you know, these younger players, there's a lot more time and energy poured into them to get them to that place eventually. But uh, I've also been able to, to hand off some of that responsibility because I've had so much help and we have such a, a sound structure in place from um, from our players themselves. And that takes time, but it's really, really rewarding to see that development and to see that process play out to where like, oh, all of that work that we did on the front end to get to this point is paying off. And it's a, it's a pretty cool feeling. And, you know, there's always a set of challenges, but to have that established, um, it makes things go a lot smoother and you're able to adapt to things a lot quicker. Yeah, I think that's a sensational point, you know, to talk about how there may be more people, but you may not have to coach the older people as much because they're able to handle so much more, whether we want to call it responsibility or leadership or whatever. But, you know, like, especially like with our case, you know, having these, these guys that have been, you know, it's obviously not their first rodeo. So they understand like, when I do X, I feel like Y. When I do A, I feel like B. And then, you know, they get into their routines and, you know, you help guide them a little bit and get them there. And then all of a sudden, these younger kids are starting to see like, well, hmm, each one of these guys that's, you know, scored over a thousand points and one who's going to set, you know, an NCAA record and one that's going to set a school record and all these things, like they seem to do a lot of things the same almost every day how do I build that and that's when it starts to get really fun is when they start to see what's made these older people successful and how you can help them then they you know they start you can see like the wheels turning or being like oh you know I wonder what what can I do to do that or what do I need to do to be that way and then they get to play kind of those self-experiments you know, with you. And that, that, it, you know, at least to me, that's the fun part. Right. Right. That's, it's including them as part of the process, right. And letting them explore their own development and, and take ownership of their own development. Right. And usually that starts with, they've got to see, see some results right off the bat and, and those results, right. Whether it's themselves experiencing it themselves, seeing it in, in other people that are having a lot of success. And uh, especially when it, all it takes is some of your best players or your upperclassmen to have that transformation and uh, showcase those um, those behaviors and that buy-in and just that commitment to the, the everyday, what it takes, right? And that's usually your, your starting point that, you know, again, it's, it's us as coaches helping guide them. It's not us telling them, it's helping them discover that for themselves. Yes, guiding them and helping them discover that for themselves. And I think that that's something that, unfortunately, a lot of us kind of forgot about when, you know, when we went through our teaching or motor learning, you know, work in the undergrad. And then all of a sudden we got to coaching and it's, um, it's a, that's a pretty neat part to your chapter too, in the manual where you talk about, you know, kind of finding yourself as a coach and building those things out and, and understanding just because there's stereotypical ways that coaches are supposed to act. It doesn't necessarily mean that's how you need to act. And like, we don't all need to be the tough guy. Like if I walked in this room right now and 
these guys walked in and I tried to be a hard ass, I'd lose about 11 or 12 of them in about four seconds. That's just yeah. how it is. I've experienced that myself. And, um, you know, I think that's a hard, it's a hard thing to, it's a hard thing for anyone, you know, it's human nature to, to want control and we all crave control to an extent. And, you know, that to relinquish that and, you know, understand too, that our athletes success is not because of us. It's, we have the amount of impact we can have on an athlete, the amount of impact we can have on wins and losses is, is tremendous, but it's not because of us. But I think when we do it in a way that again, helps them guide and discover things for themselves and also equip them with skills where they're able to figure things out for themselves. Cause ultimately we can't do it for them. Our co the coaches can't do it for them, but we have the ability to do that. But are we doing that? Or are we just trying to control everything? Uh, every part of their their training, their development, and thinking that we always know what's what's best for them. You know, I think for me personally, I had to experience some things the hard way and really, you know, get that resistance and that pushback and that failure of like this is not working and this doesn't work with this population to really try to figure out how I needed to evolve as a coach and how could I actually coach instead of just train athletes? How can I actually coach these people to change? and develop and adopt new, new ways of thinking, new ways of behaving and, and all of that. And that's a hard thing to do. It's easy to train athletes and it's easy to physically prepare them, but it's really hard to, uh, you know, if you want to do the work, it's, it's, it's hard to do that work of really like truly coaching and changing and relinquish for the betterment of the athlete. Um, you know, actually having their best interests in mind and not just what we think is the best. Yeah, you know, and I, I kind of half jokingly say this to the guys all the times. It's like at, at 5'9, 185, 190, I probably wouldn't have made it very far in Division I college basketball. So maybe you need to speak up if you have some input, like and let things be known, like where you are with progressions how you feel and that's you know this that and the third because how am I supposed to relate to six foot 11 245 pounds or six foot you know four 260 who needs to lose 40 pounds like how I don't know what you're doing you know let alone the whole individual social all of those things and cultural differences and which is a whole nother talk for another day because it, you right. know, it's a whole nother rabbit hole to run down. But like, it's, it's so cliche, but you know, two eyes, two ears, one mouth, right? And it's like, they, they're playing basketball for you guys or they're playing for us because they have some innate skill level of something that is good enough to play at that level maybe they understand something that we should be listening to just a little bit. <laughs> right. I think I wish I would have known that or learned that earlier on of just sometimes you just gotta, you gotta stop talking and start listening more. And like the amount that you can learn just from observation and obviously being in our environment, right. We work with just one team being in basketball, you're around these people all day, every day, and just literally observing them day to day, you learn so much. And by asking better questions, you learn so much. And like you said, we are, we are very different than our way of thinking. Our brains operate on a different level. We don't know anyone's experience as well as they know their own experience. And I think we don't give our athletes or just students in general enough credit to how much they actually know and understand about themselves. Now there's a lot that they, that they've got to figure out, but who are we to say what's best for them? Um, and who are we to say that we're the experts of their experience? Um, and why aren't we getting their feedback more? Why aren't we getting, why aren't we getting their feedback more about their experience training, uh, their experience with us? How can we coach them better? What do they need more of? what do they feel like we could help them more with? Like, why aren't we getting their feedback? Like, are we afraid of it? Do we just think we know everything? I don't, I don't know, but I think that's such a, that's, that's part of that humility piece of like understanding, like it's not about us. Um, 
and as cool as our job is and as as much as we all love training and making them uh better and just watching them do their thing like at the end of it like what are what are we actually leaving them with and what are we actually helping them do if it's training and that and that's all we want to do cool like that's all good but I know for me like that's not that's not it for me no no 100 percent. and I think that running down that rabbit hole is a great way to start in here with the big three but first this portion of the podcast is brought to you by eccentric Eccentric is the world leader in flywheel technology, and this year is celebrating 10 years of being just that. The addition of the Eccentric K-Box and K-Pulley to both our return to sport and general physical preparation programs have had immense positive effects on our athletes. For more information or check out the awesome catalog of products that Eccentric provides, hop on over to Eccentric.com today and make sure you let them know that CVASPS sent you. Let's let's get to these a little bit here, Mo. I think that yeah. you know talking about that stuff kind of leads right into the first one, and that's understanding mistakes that, that we make in this vocation. So let let's let's talk about a one that you see that made by strength coaches in the U.S. and or around the world, and you know how do you feel like we can do some things differently to help correct these issues? Yeah, that's a loaded question, Jay. Uh, you know, sure I- is. <laughs> Oh, I I think, you know, speaking from personal experience, I think the biggest mistake as a profession that we make is just solely focusing on our development and learning about strength and conditioning and spending so much of our time and energy and resources on um, developing more, you know, technical and tactical, tactical knowledge and you know, use of technology and and just focusing so much of our development on the training piece and not spending enough time learning from other domains and learning from other professions and learning from other aspects that, you know, transcend, you know, what we do. And I think that just the term, you know, lateral thinking, you know, what can we pull from other professions that has an impact on what we do? Because at, at the end of the day, what we do so little relies on the programs that we write that that is part of it but so much of our time we actually spend right you know we spend less time writing programs than we do um communicating uh working collaboratively with you know multiple departments um managing chaos um conflict uh there, I mean, the list goes on there, but when we, when it comes down to how we spend our time, we spend so much of our time learning um, how to train better or how to use technology better. And it was important to me early on in my career until I realized how important um, communication and leadership and um, conflict resolution and, you know, business aspects and, beha- you know, psychology behavior change all of these things are at the root of what we do on a daily basis and so but nobody teaches us those things and there's not a lot of resources for us in strength and conditioning those are things that we've got to seek elsewhere um so I think that's a huge mistake that we make is just focusing so much we're laser focused on on strength and conditioning and all of our professional development resources are are aimed at the the technical side of things and the x's and o's and the science and and all of that and Uh, I think there's just so much, you know, untapped potential in other areas. And, you know, we, when we talk to each other and we, we discuss, you know, our situations and, you know, our struggles and what we're frustrated about and, you know, our departments and, and all these things, you know, our athletes, it all comes back to the same thing. It's never usually a problem of, oh, I didn't write a good enough program. You know, I didn't get my, my guys or my girls you know, strong or fit enough. All of our our issues and our barriers and obstacles in our field come down to things that we don't spend our time, you know, learning how to navigate. So I think that's a a major downfall um, in our evolution of just, you know, being so laser focused and and not really understanding that there's more to strength conditioning than actual strength conditioning. I dig it, dude. I really do. And I think like we've talked about this a bunch and I think that it really took 
like COVID for me to really understand that, you know, to, and it was weird. I think we were talking one day when I was walking the dog and like that whole idea of like deep breath pivot attack, like kind of came into my head with everything that was going, you know, at that moment. I mean, cause that was like right when we were, my neighborhood was like the worst area in the country because of the three nursing homes that it got in, in like, what was it like April or whatever. And that really like made me start thinking about other things. And like, yeah, like, I mean, everything from personal finance to leadership and even like politics and things like that, like things that most people are afraid to talk about have become almost like my like my release valves and it's like it's funny so we have a new assistant coach who comes in the weight room all the time sensational human being and this guy's been a huge impact and a huge part of our return to play stuff too which is really neat to say like an assistant sport coach has been like super involved in the return to play stuff and he comes in and he's just like what are you listening to and it's like the rising on the hill or crystal and Sager or uh bigger pockets money or paula pant and it's like all of these different things like what are you talking what debt ceiling what are you talking about and i'm like dude like you don't know what's going on with this like this is like fascinating and if it doesn't get fixed we're screwed bro like like your 401k or your 403b throw it out out the window because the recession that's going to hit it'll be worse than 2008 he's just staring at me he's like dude, you're, you listen to weird stuff for a strength coach. And it's like, yeah, but to understand how these other intricacies work throughout the world, you can understand, especially since this game that we're so lucky to be part of is so global now. Like it really has opened a lot more dialogue with the foreign guys that I get to work with. And it's like, I think that you, you hit the nail on the head. It's, it, this is probably a terrible piece of marketing for a strength and conditioning seminar. Um, but like expanding our focus of knowledge and education is super important. And I also think again, to plug it, I think that was a huge benefit of 75 hard for me is, is forcing me to look at business books, you know, get into like the psychology of money and things like that. Like it's been, that it's been game changing. Yeah. There's so there's just so many different layers to what we do. And like you said, everything's really intertwined at the heart of it. And, you know, when we think about our jobs, you know, we are helping create a an experience for our student athletes and we're helping them navigate life. We're having that or helping them navigate um, their careers, obviously, from a sport side of things. But you know, I think we all try to preach, right? They're more than, they're more than student athletes as just as like, we have a hard time as strength coaches finding our identity outside of being a strength coach. And I think a lot of us fall into that trap. And from just, uh, like you said, a general knowledge standpoint, you know, we, we could do such a better job of getting outside our scope a little bit. And then also just understanding too, like, you know, if we're really concerned about the student athlete experience that we're giving them, like there's so much that we can pull from um, the, you know, psychology, the psychology of even psychology of design, like psychology of like, okay, the customer or consumer experience or the consumer journey, like what can we pull from business? How do businesses pull in people and make their you know, their customers, you know, have a, have an experience with them that keeps them coming back. Like, there's just like, that's just one small example, but like, there's just a lot and we don't always, we don't view it through that lens. And I think part of it is, um, you know, we get inundated with, again, that, that feeling of, we need to intake all this knowledge, um, to make it seem like we're, we're growing and developing. And a lot of that knowledge is usually what we're most comfortable with or what we want to learn about. And that's not usually getting out of our comfort zones, even though we pride ourselves on, uh, you know, being lifelong learners and always growing, but oftentimes we're still seeking things that are in our comfort zone. Um, so 
yeah, there's a, there's, that's like, again, a whole other, other conversation, but we just think we've got to get outside ourselves a little bit more and, you know, understand at the heart of it, we work with people and people are really, really complicated. And what we want to accomplish with them requires just more than our, our knowledge of, you know, preparing basketball players to play basketball at a high level. Um, and we work with obviously not just athletes, but other people on our staff, other departments, other people that have a lot differing views than we do. How do we get people to work together? How do we get people to um, listen and change ideas? And again, like we're all we're all just trying to solve this this puzzle. But, you know, we're trying to find solutions and and help, and it goes beyond uh, you know sets and reps. Yeah, and I think that that's an absolutely perfect lead in to number two. You know, we're talking about educating coaches and things that need to kind of move more to the forefront. So what advice would you give a coach to improve their knowledge, and you know, in their continuing education? You know, is it something and, and where do you think people need to start? Because I think that that's one thing that a lot of people have a hard time with with it, right? Is there like, Oh, well, you know, I heard Jay talk about it on My Thoughts Monday that we should be looking at more personal finance stuff. So I looked at that in, you know, the podcast app and there's trillions of podcasts or, you know, people talk about current events and there's a trillion podcasts. Like where does Molly see as a good starting point for people to start to branch off of? Yeah, I think that's such an individual process. And I think you got to figure out for yourself, like what is most important to you and what do you value most? And also what do you need the most right now for your uh, role or the environment that you're in? Because again, it's, there's information overload right now. Like we have knowledge at our fingertips at a rate that we've never had before from just social media, from Google, like we can find answers to anything and information like in 0.1 second, right? So it's overwhelming at times, just how much content is out there. And it gets really hard to filter through the BS and also like what is actually important. But I think that's different for each person. And I think, especially as a young coach, I think there's pressure, you gotta know everything. And you do, you've gotta have a really generalized knowledge base. Um, but I think, you know, as a young professional starting out in your career, like you've gotta figure out what is going to make the biggest difference in my role right now is it truly a, a technical thing like do I need to learn how to condition our team better like is that the point that I'm at or that is that I need right now or are things going pretty smoothly and I've got to figure out a way to you know evolve and change the game a little bit so like figuring out what's important to you and what you in that moment is step one because that's going to help weed out everything that's not important in, in that moment um, and I think you've got to really like that simple approach of like one thing at a time, because I know I, for me, like, and you probably experience the same thing. Like I get overwhelmed. And I'm like, I want to learn about this and I want to do this and I want to do that X, Y, and Z. And when I don't just simplify and be like, okay, no, this is first. And I'm going to spend my time in the next, however long, like focusing on this area and get really good at that before I start branching out. And I think as you get further along in your career um, and you've got a pretty good pulse on you know, the things that don't require a lot of energy now, like the technical and programming and all of that, like you've got more time to spend kind of exploring and figuring out, you know, and spending more time on that lateral thinking of like, what other areas can I pull from to make me better at my role, but also like, what do I want to learn about? So I think, um, you know, you've got, you kind of go through that pendulum too, of like, when you first start out in your career, like you've got to spend time learning about the technical and you've got to learn about physiology and you've got to have that foundation of knowledge um, and you've got to figure out, okay, what's the lowest hanging fruit and what's going to make the most impact right here, right now. And then as you go, it's, it's always evolving, uh, based on your environment and based on you personally and what you value and what you care about. And then figuring out who can I learn from who's doing this really, really well. And what's the best resource out there. And then being able to filter through that way, because you're right, there's a million podcasts, there's a million books and there's a million articles, but you know, at the end of the day, like you don't get better by just reading an article or reading a book, like you've got to put skin in the game. And that involves like getting out of your comfort zone and going something that's going to help you grow or someone that's going to help you grow um, in an area that 
you know, again, is probably maybe a little foreign to you. And, but you got to be really good about having that filter of like what I, what you need individually. Yeah, I'm, I'm with it a hundred percent. I think that just to piggyback off, you know, that initial thought of what do you need right now? You know, and if you look at things and you think you have a pretty good handle on it, I think the next step to look at is what's going to make you better in the long run too, right? Like, again, a terrible point for a marketing thing for a seminar. But if you sit there and you're like, man, you know, our conditioning numbers were great. Uh, but what, you know, I just don't feel like I can communicate as openly as I want because I'm afraid about X, Y, or Z with your job. Like maybe learning about finance or investing or things like that would be better for you professionally because if you're not worried about those things, if that, you know, if, if, if that's all taken care of and you've got those ducks in order, then maybe you are more open to, you know, express what you see and how you see it. Um, you know, if it's something where, man, the programming was great, but it's just like, people just didn't seem to, it, it didn't have the same energy or people didn't seem as whatever. I mean, maybe it's a leadership you know, route or a communication route or something that you need to go down. Or maybe it's just something that you need to find that is just so different. You know, like, I can't remember exactly what it was that Megan said, but in her Outside the Rack, Megan Young brought up some astrophysics thing that she was into. And I can't even remember how to say it, let alone spell it. And it's just like, that's amazing to me that someone can find something that's just so different than the, because in a theoretical sense, so different than what we do, but it's so connected in a way to what we do that it's, it's a release and an expansion at the same point. So like even things like that, like it's gotta be something that's gonna push you and we love to say, you know, you need to be comfortable being uncomfortable. But at the same time, anytime somebody looks at what we do and asks a question, we put our guard up. Yeah. I think that's something yeah. we got to look at. I agree. I agree. I think you know, it makes me laugh. You get Megan on a, a tangent about quantum physics and it makes my, my brain hurt. But I think that like you make such a good point there of like, you know, I know for me personally, I went through that when I, my first year of South Carolina, you know, i the, we got results, you know, strength coach standards. I did my job well, but people didn't enjoy the weight room. I wasn't making, I wasn't building relationships the way I wanted. I wasn't having the results that I wanted. And I had to figure out what was going to make the most difference. Is it going to be figure out how to train basketball players better? Or was it going to be, I need to figure out how to, I need to be a better person. I need to lead better. I need to coach better. I need to connect better. I need to also also knowing that all of those skills, communication, leadership, all of that is going to transcend my role as a strength coach. Because for me, like, I'm not going to be a strength coach for the rest of my life. I'm just, I'm not. I have too many other things that I, I love and that I love my job now, but I also know this is going to transcend every aspect of my life. It's going to make my relationships better. It's going to make, it's going to set me up for multiple things in my future. And so that was the route that I have invested my time and energy in. And then now it's, I'm at that point where from, a you know, again, that lateral thinking, like what other areas am I, am I potentially interested in? Like, I'm trying to look at some different things right now and be involved in, you know, I'm looking at even just within my role, exploring different aspects. Like I, I asked our, uh, our kids, I'm like, Hey, if you could do anything different with our space in this weight room, like, what would you want? Like, what would you do differently with this space? And they all talked about like this wall that we have and like, different graphics and just like the different vibe of this room and all this stuff. And so now I'm like going down this, this rabbit hole of design and like the psychology of design and like how different, how design impacts people and motivation and all this stuff. And I'm looking at like, you know, I'm involved in our, uh, I'm the chair of our student athlete experience committee. So now I'm, I'm looking up different things and, and researching different things when it comes to, you know, engineering um, experience and pulling from, you know, customer experience and, and business and all these different things and like how you design an environment 
And so like you get to that point in your career where again, like what is, you've got everything kind of under control, um, but what else are you interested in? How else can you grow and look at things through a different lens to help, uh, you know, evolve what you're already doing, make it better, but also give you a different skill set and make you more marketable and also open your eyes to different avenues. Like sometimes we think like we're so set on strength and conditioning and, like, and it looks a certain way, but like what else are, what other avenues could we go down that incorporates a lot of the same things that we do, but it's different. Like we don't even know sometimes what those options are. Nah, dude, that's rad. And I think that that's the design thing is something that I think is always neat because there's so many different things that even like color schemes and stuff for certain people are, you know, are different reactions and even like outputs, which is like kind of crazy to me, like how that that can impact you, like your vision connects to your brain, obviously your nervous system and all that, which is like, all of that is just like, just blows my mind, you know, it, it's, it's pretty awesome but let me get you out of here on this mall you know pittsburgh april 29th and 30th what can people expect from molly benetti at the seminar yeah i mean first of all man i can't explain how excited i am uh you know i spoke for the first time in in an in-person event a couple months ago and i forgot how incredible it is to just be in front of people and actually interact with people instead of looking at a freaking zoom screen so um, I think, first of all, you can expect me to be really energized. Um, and I think, you know, regardless of what it is that I present on, you know, you're going to get that, you're going to get that energy and something that I'm extremely passionate about. And I think one thing I always tend to bring to the table is I'm going to challenge people to view things differently. And I'm going to challenge the status quo and challenge our current way uh, we think and what we believe and value and you know, our assumptions about our roles. And I think just try to bring different perspectives and, and stretch people's minds a little bit and, and help people grow. I think that's the heart of it. Like, that's what I love the most is, is helping that, helping that growth process and, and learning. And yeah, it's uh, sometimes, you know, my, my views and, and what I, the way that I think I know is sometimes against the grain a little bit. And, you know, maybe not popular or popularly, uh, you know, adopted, but I think that's also how we get better and, and what we need more of. And so I can, you know, if nothing else, I can, I can guarantee that, but I can guarantee you, uh, you know, I'll, I'll bring that energy and have that passion and what, you know, be really excited about the opportunity to, to speak to people and connect with people and, you know, build that community. Yeah, well, one thing I can say for sure is your ability to challenge the status quo is something that I always will hold very, very near and dear to me and is something that's helped not just CVAS, but Jay DeMeo grow and develop here in the last 18 months. And it's it's something that, that I really needed and I'm so excited to have you as part of it. And the other thing that we can guarantee about April 29th and 30th is Molly and I will not be on 75 hard at that point of the year. Either. So <laughs> no, no, we will not. We will have a good time. <laughs> yes, ma'am. That we will. Well, Mal, as always, great to see you. Stoked to have you up in Pittsburgh and, and so grateful for your time today. Thank you so much for spending the time with us. No, no, thank you. Grateful for you and having me on and also for, you know, inviting me to be a part of the event in person for the first time. So uh, thankful for your friendship and, and all you do for us. So thank you. Appreciate it. Mom. We'll be in touch real soon. Sounds good. Yeah. Cheers.